Apologies, I'm in English. I'm um, very I just uh, moved to Paris and uh, I'm still working on my French. Maybe I can come back in a year and try again in French. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, today I'm going to talk to you about um, hardware. And obviously, this is quite a, potentially a, a scary topic for a lot of software developers. I, I have a lot of friends who don't go anywhere near hardware because it's scary. You, as soon as electricity is involved, it becomes this sort of strange world of analog devices that are doing their own things and out of control. But what I'm going to try and do today is prove to you that actually a lot of electronics related to uh, computer science and particularly object oriented programming languages like Java, uh, and you can actually relate a lot of concepts in electronics to concepts within OOP. So I'm the developer evangelist at a company called Sigfox. Uh, Sigfox we're building a network for connected devices, all about uh, the Internet of Things and enabling sensors and data in the real world to communicate. But um, my main topic today is about Sigfox, it's about hardware specifically, analog electronics, and why it's not, not as complicated as it actually seems. So the myth. Hardware is hard. Uh, I don't believe this. I think, in reality, that no, it isn't. I think that a lot of people have this idea that because there's things going on that are invisible to the eye, you can't see down at an electron level what's going on, that it's complicated. Um, but actually, a lot of concepts in uh, electronic engineering, particularly hardware design, relate to computer science or relate to object oriented programming. So what I'm going to try and do here is show you that some of the concepts, things like um, classes, objects, inheritance, abstraction, they're all concepts that are used to design electronics. Um, so I'm going to start off with some fundamentals, um, some low-level stuff, and then build up with some examples and show you how uh, basic electronics can be put together um, through means of inheritance uh, to build up more complicated devices, things that you would First, look at and decide that, oh, wow, this is really complicated, but then actually, when you break it down into smaller pieces, it's actually very simple. So, you can break electronics down into sort of four main categories, and these are loose, they're not uh, concrete, they're just generics. So, you have active components, things like transistors, diodes, uh, LEDs, passive components, resistors, uh, capacitors, inductors, power sources, solar power, AC, DC. Uh, and integrated circuits. And again, integrated circuits are really an abstraction of active devices. So they're built from uh, transistors, lots of really small transistors on a, a nano scale. But we use them as an abstraction, so you don't normally worry about the insides of the CPU, you don't normally worry about the insides of an op amp. Um, and Sigfox is an abstraction on, uh, on a transistor base for communications. So who's heard of a PLL FM demodulation system? No. <laughs> Who's listened to a radio before? Yeah? Well, if you listen to a radio, you've actually used one of these. Um, so in your car radio, in your radio at home, uh, it'll actually be using a phase lock loop frequency modulation demodulation system. And that sounds complicated, um, but I'm going to try and prove to you that it actually isn't. So this device is uh, constructed of three different components, three major components. Active filters, phase detectors, uh, and voltage controlled oscillators. And again, they seem like com uh, complicated topics, complicated objects, but really they break down into smaller components. So I'm taking the active filter as an example. Um, we have RC filters uh, and op amps, which come together to make active filters. Within RC filters, you have capacitors and resistors. And all these elements come together um, to create more complicated devices. So this is a series of inheritance. So you have pieces uh, like resistors and capacitors to create more complicated objects. So this is a, uh, a passive filter the, at the very bottom of the, uh, the hierarchy that I showed you earlier, uh, an RC device. So this is a low-pass filter, uh, and this is a, a fundamental object in electronics. So this device takes a, uh, an oscillating signal or a high-frequency signal, so for example, uh, an incoming radio frequency wave, uh, and actually filters out any high-frequency components. So the way this capacitor behaves is that when uh, there's a signal incoming that's high frequency, um, it actually acts as a closed circuit. So uh, on this schematic here, if it's a closed circuit, it would pull the current to ground. And that means that there would be no voltage on the output uh, if it's a high frequency signal. If it's a low frequency signal or a DC signal, um, the signal will actually pass through to the output. Uh, and again, so you sort of see from the pseudocode that I'm uh, equivalent to it, that um, depending on the RC values you choose, the values of the resistor and the capacitor, uh, you can actually dictate which frequency uh, is the cutoff, 
Uh, and you can go into hours and hours talking about uh, how to build ideal filters, uh, ideal systems, but in reality, this is all you need to know. Uh, so this is the very fundamental of an active filter. We can take this a step further and make it more complicated. We can add uh, an amplification stage. So this triangle here is uh, what's known as an op amp. Uh, these are on transistors. So those are my I spoke about earlier. The transistor is basically a voltage controlled switch. So you input a voltage to its control terminal, uh, and it, it basically acts as a switch, and along with this voltage or no voltage. And an op amp is an abstraction of this. And the way it works is that you have three terminals, uh, positive, negative, and output. Uh, and what it, it tries to do is it tries to match the voltage at the positive and negative terminals of the device so that the output, uh, so, so, so that the voltages are the same. And it does this by uh, varying the output. So in the case that, uh, for example, the uh, positive terminal is, in, is above the negative terminal in terms of voltage, um, the device can actually produce a larger output um, to balance it. And the way this works is through a feedback loop between R1 and R2, and these resistors are what's known as a voltage divider. So all this does is takes the voltage and cuts it into the ratio that you decided between R1 and R2. Uh, and the device works extremely fast, uh, such that when you're inputting a signal to it, it can respond uh, and try to balance that. And the way that it does that, it will boost the output uh, at V out. Um, again, again, it seems to start getting more and more complicated, but if you break it down, it's actually simple components. So this is only built of uh, really three parts. You have an op amp, uh, resistors, and capacitors. Um, I'm going to kind of rush through this. If I have more time, I'd, I'd like to go in more depth and explain things. But the general properties of these devices is fairly simple. So. I'm going to get back to these. I'll, I'll come back at the end and talk about um, why I explain those, those devices. Um, but I thought I'd go through some tips and tricks for if you want to actually build your own electronics on a, a breadboard or if you want to use a, a design PCB, a printed circuit board. Um, these are some useful tips that you can use for your designs. So, unfortunately, these didn't come in one at a time. But uh, the first point is resistors stop things from catching fire. Um, this is a very important point. Um, what resistors do is they limit current. So, uh, in electronics, you have two main uh, elements of electricity, you have voltage and current. Voltage is the, uh, it can be thought of as like the amount of energy, so the potential of energy, uh, and current can be thought of as the flow uh, of energy. So the way that resistors work is they actually uh, absorb current. Um, I realize I'm running out of time, I'm going to speed this up, but um, they, they, they absorb current, uh, and what that does is it stops other devices from uh, experiencing overloads. Capacitors through voltage supplies, Capacitors are uh, energy stores, so if there's fluctuations or variations in an incoming voltage supply, they absorb that. Um, and I'm going to simulate things before breaking them. So this is another thing when you're writing software, um, the test-driven uh, approach, so you write the test before you actually deploy to make sure that there's nothing going to break when it actually is deployed. Same thing here. Before you build something, before you get it manufactured, before you get it produced, you want to test it, and there's some great tools for doing that. If you want to find out more, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, learning what to fit the breadboard. So the breadboard, if you're not aware, is actually um, effectively a piece of copper uh, with lots of different holes in it, and you can plug uh, components into it to prototype. Um, and it's your best friend. Uh, you can use these to experiment before actually having to spend money to buy PCBs, to buy expensive components. Um, and if they break on a breadboard, it's okay, because it's not going to break in the hands of hundreds of thousands of uh, consumers. So hardware isn't hard when you treat it like building blocks. It's this OOP concept that uh, everything's built of individual pieces and it all builds up to more complicated devices. Um, but as the programming, it can get complicated. Uh, when you start looking at things like power efficiency, uh, communication protocols, um, there's a reason why people train for years uh, to become electronic engineers, why they do PhDs, why they study. And this is because it can get really complicated. And, and there's reasons why companies produce uh, integrated circuits, these abstractions on complicated devices, because it's all about making your life easier. So this is the PLL FM demotivation system I was talking about earlier, and this looks really complicated. But in reality, the active filter that I spoke to you about earlier is in this red box. And it's not quite the same uh, device that I showed you, but it's actually very similar. Uh, and you can do this with the whole uh, schematic, you can break it down into smaller pieces. Uh, and I could have done the same thing with any of the elements on here and shown you how it builds up from smaller, smaller pieces to become these larger abstractions. 
Um, and so what we're doing at Sigfox, uh, to relate back to this actually, is we, we're building systems that are, well, we're building a network designed for systems to make your life easier for communications. So our network runs on a protocol that's based off of um, a modulation scheme called BPSK, uh, Binary Phase Shift Scheme, which is actually very similar to FM radio, um, which is why I use this example. And what we've done with Sigfox is we basically made a protocol that's really simple for you to get started making your devices communicate to um, the, the wider world. So uh, if you want to get started, there's really good kits, um, basically Arduinos. I'm sure many people are aware of Arduinos. But these effectively have uh, this board, this new lab security board, has a Sigfox module on it. Uh, and this module allows you to access our network uh, protocol. It's all about small messages, so 12 byte po uh, message payloads, optimized for sensor data. Low power consumption, uh, easy to interface with, so if you have access to serial device on an Arduino, it's the same way you do it for a Sigfox module on the secure board. You just open a, a serial uh, connection and begin. Simple as that. We have the Sigfox Cloud, which lets you um, access all your data. So once you've transmitted a message, you can retrieve your message from our, uh, our backend, our, our cloud. You can do this with REST APIs and callbacks. Um, there's many modules to choose from. We work with lots of different partners to produce many chips. So this example here is with a company called Telecom uh, Design. We also work with companies like Texas Instruments to produce modules. Uh, and one of the nice things about our design, uh, our network, is that uh, we've actually made it free for makers. So if you're a developer and you want to experiment with connecting devices, you can use our network completely free. It's free for makers. Uh, so if you want to experiment, try and retrieve the data, small sensor data, it's absolutely free. So that's been my talk. Uh, my name is Alex, and uh, hopefully I can come back in a few years and give this talk in French. Um, but so I hope you've enjoyed it, and I enjoyed being here, so thank you. I'll take any questions if you have any. Yeah, what I like about software development is that if you have a computer, if you have an ID, you can quickly test it out without spending any money, and you can just have something done in a few hours. Do you have any advice on how you can do that with hardware, where to find the resources, what to buy to, to get things done? Yeah, so uh, I spoke kind of really briefly about some simulation tools. Um, and there's a really nice tool called LT Spice. Um, and this is uh, originally created by Linear uh, Technologies LT. Um, and it's basically a simulation package for uh, animal electronics. So you can do things like uh, drag and drop components, uh, change values build complicated schematics and actually test them for really quite complicated things. So if you wanted, for example, to build a uh, frequency demodulation system, you could build it in a software package, simulate it, check the frequencies that it operates at, temperatures, um, basically do your tests like you would do for software, uh, push it to the limits and see where it breaks. Um, uh, if you tweet me afterwards, I can send you a link to it or, or have you find out about it. But there's some fantastic packages. So LT Spice is one. There's a lot of other um, more simple uh, simulation tools online. I think there's, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but again, if you tweet me, I'll, 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 I'll remember and uh, I'll try and send the link to you. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I just didn't get it. Uh, so you have your own board, right? Uh, right? So, with Sigfox is this. Yeah. So Sigfox we actually build a network. We work with a, uh, a bunch of different partners who produce the hardware. Um, so what we do, we have a network as a service. Mm -hmm. So we're all about uh, enabling your data rather than actually yeah. building chips, um, yeah. which is why we have a bunch of companies manufacturing chips to use our network. Yeah. So do you know of any like, fun projects that was built with? Yeah, so actually we have one today that's um, sort of trending a little bit viral. There's, um, one of uh, the interns in office built a target, um, a nerf target, mm -hmm. shooting with like, nerf guns. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, every time someone walks past or, or shoots a target, mm -hmm. it's um, thinking of a sick box. But the nice thing about the sick box protocol is that it's really easy to set up. So you don't need to configure it with a password or a username like you would do connected to a Wi Fi network. Um, wherever there's coverage, you simply just transmit a message. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about making it really simple to send small information like sensors. So either an on or off, temperature. Humidity, it could be anything um, in the real world that you try to collect. It's all about small data, high efficiency, uh, low power, and a wide range. So, we have national coverage in, in, in France, um, we're rolling out globally, uh, but as we, as we extend our network, more and more countries will be able to basically send a message from anywhere uh, and be able to just connect. Mm -hmm.
can you put it, for instance, in a watch? Yes, uh, it can actually get really, really small. So the modules, uh, you can at the moment are three centimeters uh, in length. Um, the hard thing about the box is that um, obviously performance is going to be determined by uh, your antenna. So if you have a better antenna, you're going to have better performance. Um, if, you, if you're going for a, building a watch, you could build a small antenna. You wouldn't have the best reception. Um, but it's the same thing with uh, a Wi-Fi device. If you have a small antenna, it's, it's going to inhibit your uh, performance. In fact, there is a watch being manufactured right now, a uh, startup working on a device for all people. Uh, so, full detection, uh, alert button, stuff like that. Uh, <coughs> when you use the Python, do you have a Python Seekbox? Yeah. Are you um, locked to the platform you provide, or do you, or is it possible to retrieve the data and use it in other applications? So, you can retrieve the data and do whatever you want with it. Um, you can use the callbacks to post the data to your server. Um, Basically, all, all we're doing is, is making a, a, a portal for you to connect to. Um, so once you've, once you've retrieved the data from Sigmox, it's yours. You can do whatever. You don't have to use our platform. All we're there is, uh, therefore, is a method to retrieve your data. Okay. And so do you provide security at any point? Or yes. Are um, there is security with the platform. I'm not an expert at this. Um, so if you, if you want to find out more about that, you can email us. Uh, you can email me, and I'll break it down to you. But um, I don't want to go out and try to explain to you now without knowing uh, full detail. Thank you.